So good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Ian Gable. I'm from the University of Victoria in Victoria, BC, which is just 60 kilometers across the Strait of Georgia uh, in the beautiful city of Victoria. I highly recommend it. You can get there from the float planes that are on this, uh, you know, the conference logo just underneath the conference center, quick trip. Um, today, I'm going to be telling you about federating clouds for high energy physics. This was a work done by many people and supported by many different organizations, not just me. They're, they're listed on this title slide. So the outline for today is I'm going to give you a quick overview of experimental physics, um, experimental high energy physics, that is, um, in terms of the technology. And this is what really personally grabbed me. Um, I'm going to talk about what our workloads look like. Then I'm going to talk about the components of our distributed cloud. Um, those are uh, Cloud Scheduler, Glint, and Shoal, and then I'm going to talk to you about some results. So this is the very picture that really got me hooked on high energy physics. Um, if you look at the top of that red ring, you see a major international airport. That's the Geneva International Airport. And then you have Lake Geneva next to it. And you see that red ring. That's the, that's the ring of the Large Hadron Collider. Um, it's 27 kilometers in circumference. And I saw a poster with this hanging up in a professor's office. And then I kind of shifted my career to focus on this for many years. And this was really the picture that got it started for me. So if you look down in that ring, you'll see this device. And this is the, you know, the beam line of the Large Hadron Collider. Here's a guy doing some work. Um, this was in repairs done around 2008. Um, if you look at this in the far distance, you can see this slight turn to the left. This kind of always blew me away that the scale of this is that the, the tunnel is nearly straight, but you just have this slight curve. It really gives you an idea of the scale. And from a more technical um, perspective, looking underneath this, what you have is two counter-rotating beams of protons. One's going around clockwise, the other one's going around counterclockwise in that beam pipe. And what we do is we intersect them at different points along this collider ring. I'm sure lots of people have heard about this from Tim Bell and other um, CERN guys. But what I'm going to tell you a little bit about next is the Atlas detector. Um, it's sitting right here, uh, conveniently close to the CERN cafeterias. Um, if you're on these various different experiments that are on the other side of the ring, not quite so convenient. Um, let's take a quick look uh, inside that detector. So this is a picture of this detector in 2005. There's a big hole in the middle. You'll see in a minute why I'm showing you a picture from 2005. To set the scale, the guy at the bottom, I mean, there's a human sitting at the bottom. Um, in 2014, when you get down there, the cavern is now so packed full of equipment that you can't get a picture like that anymore. So you get a picture of yourself standing in front of a wall of uh, technology. The detector itself is 7,000 metric tons. Um, it's five stories tall. It's sitting on that beam line in this ring, uh, about 100 meters underground. Different parts of this detector were actually built in Canada. This piece here, the hadronic end cap calorimeter, as it's called, was built five kilometers from where we're sitting today. So this is um, a, a truly international collaboration. There's 171 different institutions in the world that are working on this particular detector. Um, so at this point, you're probably wondering, so why are you hearing about this at an OpenStack uh, conference? And the, one of the major challenges with these high energy physics experiments is, in fact, um, storing, analyzing, moving all the data associated with this, um, collecting the information about these collisions. So this is a cross-section of that detector that I just showed you, a bit of a 3D cross-section. You can see what happens at a, a collision point. Um, you have this shower of particles flying out of this collision point. This is, in fact, a candidate Higgs boson. This is this particle that we've been looking for for a number of years. And we do these collisions 40 million times per second. You know, at 40 megahertz, we're, c we're crossing bunches of protons. And then we have to read out that detector. Um, 
I want to make it clear that the Atlas detector is not the only high energy physics detector in the world. There's many. There's in fact four at CERN, four large experiments. Um, but this is another one where we're working on the computing towards clouds um, called Bell 2. Uh, this is at the KEK laboratory in Japan. It has vastly different physics goals, but the common theme is the data, the format of the data is very similar. Um, between these types of experiments, even if the physics goals is quite different. So we can share a lot of the technology across these experiments. So the scale of this is Atlas has roughly 170 petabytes of disk today. Um, that's increasing. Um, that's only the Atlas experiment. There's many other detectors with lot, large amounts of data. Um, we can really expect that high energy physics is going to cross into this exascale in the coming years. Um, you know, this is a virtual certainty. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit about the details of, of why I'm uh, talking to you today. So let's talk a little bit about the type of computing that we have to do for this ex these experiments. Most of the jobs are so-called embarrassingly parallel. Um, some people don't like that word, some people want to use pleasingly parallel, but the message is these are not um, tightly coupled computing jobs. Um, we don't need things like MPI interconnects, we don't need low latency interconnects. The, um, these events that we've collected at this 40 million times per second can be parallelizable across uh, individual events. Um, most of the computing jobs, the tasks that we run, are sort of 1 to 24 hours in length. And the jobs are either Monte Carlo simulations, where we're simulating this particle um, interaction, or we're actually taking the data from the detector and analyzing it. Um, and so today, most of the workload for these experiments is done on a collection of Linux clusters. There's sort of the 500 core to 10,000 core. There's very large sites like CERN and others in the US. But that's sort of an average. Um, there's on the order of 200 of these sites around the world that, that work on um, these experiments. And on an, any given day on these Linux clusters, you can see something like 300,000 cores uh, running at one time. So this is, I want to emphasize, this is not all on clouds today. Um, however, one of the things that we had with this, these classical grid computing model is all these sites were federated. We had federated storage, single sign-on for all the services. A physicist could run across all 200 sites and not need credentials for any of them. Uh, you'll see why that's important in a minute. So now on to infrastructure as a service timeline. I want to tell you a little bit of a story on why we're here, because I think it might be different from the typical industrial use cases. Um, you know, we weren't looking to sell anything or um, use our resources in a different way, but what we wanted to be able to do was run our particular types of jobs on other resources which we didn't control with less work. So, you know, typically in the past it's been package your code to run on someone else's Linux cluster, pretty difficult to do. So in 2005, when Zen came along, we started looking at that initially uh, as a way to package our stuff up, like today you would do with a container and VM. And we discovered we could do that with really not a lot of penalties. So we started looking at virtualization very early. Um, and the, you know, the first naive thing we did was start writing Perl scripts for our Linux cluster to do all these sort of things. Then we discovered um, a project called uh, Nimbus that was providing a very early infrastructure as a service uh, API before Amazon, way before OpenStack. Um, so then we saw that there was a future in this. Amazon came along. This really didn't have a lot of impact for us because we couldn't afford it. We didn't have high bandwidth networks to Amazon. So that really didn't change anything. Then we started seeing multiple of these clouds emerge, these Nimbus clouds. And then eventually OpenStack arrived. And this really started to change things for us because this thing that we'd been hoping for, there was finally enough industrial momentum on it. And when you started talking about virtualizing, um, research and education clusters, people didn't think you were crazy anymore. Um, then we started seeing multiple OpenStack clouds. And then the big thing that really enabled us to get a lot of traction in, in this is when CERN had the vision to um, move into OpenStack and start virtualizing their entire infrastructure. 
Um, and this is, this is what really you know, enabled us to start moving on this very hard. So here's today's uh, problem, and it's also an opportunity. Uh, these yellow DAWs that you ski see scattered in Australia, Europe, and North America are the OpenStack clouds to which we have access today. These are primarily at universities and um, research institutions around the world. We're also using uh, EC2 and Google Compute Engine, um, but we're primarily using OpenStack. So the problem that we have is we want our jobs to run across these many different clouds, and there's not, there wasn't a particularly easy way to do that. We also have some constraints that are different from maybe other situations. We're getting um, often contributions in kind. It's often from institutions that have nothing to do with high energy physics, but they have spare resources, spare capacity within their OpenStack clouds. So we can't go to that cloud provider and say, please implement this federation solution, please do this because they've given us an account, the resources, and they're not there to provide support for us in many cases. In many cases they are, but you know, it's a, it's a mix. Um, I just wanted to point out a few of the clouds involved. There's Canary Clouds, this is a, a research network institution uh, in Canada, Chameleon in the US, there's CERN, Imperial College, and Nectar, and I see people in the audience from many different of these clouds that have um, supported us. So now I'm going to talk to you about um, the components of this distributed system. What we've done is mixed up uh, many different um, already available components and then added a few small things where we needed to to close the gaps. So to manage jobs, we use HD Condor, which is an extremely scalable, um, scalable batch computing system that's uh, quite well known. I'll talk about that in a second. Then we have this product called Cloud Scheduler, which monitors the job queues of this batch system, and then will create VMs for those needs. I'm going to go over that. Then we have Shoal for um, web cache discovery, and a thing called Glint, which I think will be quite interesting to this community, um, for pushing out VMs to many different OpenStack clouds. And then, of course, we have the virtual machine itself. We use CERN VM and uh, a special file system called CERN VMFS, which I'll tell you about. So uh, Condor, probably many people in the room know quite a bit about Condor. Um, it uses this collection of daemons, which you can run on multiple different nodes to scale out the um, capacity to run jobs across multiple different nodes. And it has a, a daemon called the start D creatively, that when a, when a machine starts up, it registers with a collector, and this mechanism um, called matchmaking occurs, where you match the requirements of the computing job uh, with the resource that's advertised itself. You make that match, and then you execute the job on that resource. Um, there's, there's tons of information about this, and this is a very scalable product. Um, it's been around since 1984, uh, believe it or not. So this is really the key architecture diagram for our system. Down at the bottom, you have HT Condor, the batch scheduling system. And at the top, you have Cloud Scheduler, which is the, the piece of software that's monitoring the job queues of Condor. Uh, when it sees a job waiting in a queue, in Condor's queue, what it does is it makes a API call to OpenStack, EC2, or Google Compute Engine to boot a VM. And then we pass in the contextualization information into that VM to cause it to boot and then register with that Condor head node like you saw before. And so while there are jobs remaining that require that type of worker node, as we call them, that job um, that VM will stay running, Condor will, um, Cloud Scheduler will keep that VM running. When there are no jobs that need that type of VM, it will shut that VM down. So what happens is a uh, cluster bursts into existence to run your BAS jobs when they're sitting in the queue. When the queue's drained, it gets shut down. So I wanted to show a few details of this. 
Uh, this looks pretty impenetrable, but there's only really a few important things. So this is, this is the way many, uh, you know, many scientists around the world do their batch computing. It's not just high energy physics. Um, if you have batch jobs to need to, you need to run, you compose you know, a text file effectively that tells you what binary you want to execute and a few properties of the VM or the machine that you need to run. So we're talking about memory and disk. Uh, we're talking about which ex executable you're going to run and what you're going to do with the jobs when they die or when they finish. And then there's these extra set of attributes you're seeing in this bottom part here. Uh, one of them is the uh, AMI. So this is the image you want. You want this particular job to execute on an image of this type. Um, then you want to use an instance type of this. Um, then there's this other thing, target clouds, which in this case is um, a list. You're going to see it in a second, but it's a list of other clouds that this job will run on. And I'll show you that in a second. So on the cloud scheduler component, you configure it to describe the resources that you have available to run jobs. So um, you basically describe what type of API access you have, the, you know, the endpoint URL, um, some things like network properties. So what you're seeing in here is two separate clouds. You know, we have a list of a dozens. Um, this is an arbitrarily assigned name uh, that you can give your cloud for easy reference. And so you, you create this list of clouds that Cloud Scheduler can execute the VMs for your Condor job on. Uh, so I want to give you an example operational task. And this is, this is having an easy way to deal with clouds coming in and out of your infrastructure. You saw we had these dots all over this map earlier, the yellow dots. And that's by no means a static list. We'll have some this week, none, some this week, and some will drop out the following week. And it's an ever-evolving list of who is making cloud resources available to us over time. So we need um, good operational ways to bring those clouds in and out. And we need to do that without affecting users. So I'm, I'm giving you an example email here to one of our um, admins. And you know, we'll get a typical request like, we want to take a cloud down for maintenance uh, for two days, you know, next week sometime. And then the state of the cloud will be we have, say, a thousand cores uh, worth of VMs running on a particular cloud. But we also have a whole bunch of jobs waiting in our job queue that need those type of VMs. So the first step is using a command like this to uh, prevent any more VMs from booting on that cloud. And then the really nice thing that we can do is start draining that cloud. So we can set each one of the VMs such that when all the jobs that are running on that VM, keep in mind there might be eight different jobs running on an eight core VM. And so it waits till every job is finished on that VM and then shuts it down. So this effectively drains all the jobs out of those VMs and kills them when they're done. So we can, we can maintain operations without users feeling the hit of different cl clouds going up and down. So our next problem that we have to address is we have too many clouds to manage VMs um, manually on, VM images manually on. Uh, we used to do this when we had four or five of them. We have a new version of the image. We go and we go, we go push it out. Um, it was fine for expert users, but we have other users come in. And it's just an incredibly error-prone process to go push um, VMs out. So it was workable, say, at the five cloud level. But when you get up to the 20 cloud level, it's just not even uh, it's not feasible anymore to do this in any kind of a useful way. So we developed um, a service called Glint. Notice it sounds a bit like Glance. Um, and I'm going to tell you a bit about that and some of our goals to integrating this or adding these features within the OpenStack uh, ecosystem. So this is what it does in very, very simple terms. So say Cloud One is your home cloud. This is the one you log in on, to, on a daily basis to develop your VM images and test your jobs before you want to run at scale. So you have an image sitting there on your home cloud, Cloud One. 
And then a user uses the Glint service to say, OK, now I want this image propagated to all the clouds for which I have credentials. So Glint will suck in, authenticate with Keystone, and suck in that image from Glance from your home cloud, and then push it all out to all your remote clouds. Um, let me show you where that fits within the architecture. So, uh, you know, Glint is another component in uh, OpenStack, although we'd like, we will likely want to move some of these features into other existing components. Our goal was not to add something new. It was just a neat way to demo um, the features that we wanted. Although when I say demo, we're using this in production today. So we also add we also add pages to Horizon. I'll show you a screenshot for that in a second. Um, so on the left here, you have uh, a screenshot of adding the various different other clouds to your home cloud where you want this propagated out to. I want to emphasize that you don't need to do anything to these other clouds. You can have this service installed just on your home cloud and have your images pushed out to your remote cloud. So you don't add a requirement. Um, you don't add a requirement to clouds that you're running on. And then so after you've added clouds to this um, list of available clouds, you can just go in and select which clouds you want your image propagated out to. Um, as I showed you in that previous architecture diagram, there's also an API for this, and there's also a CLI um, tool for this, which I'm not going to show you. So the goals for Glint. Um, we have learned a lot this week. Um, we've seen that there's big progress being made on uh, federation, and we want to leverage that as much as possible. Uh, we want to take advantage, in particular, of Keystone um, Federation. We saw that uh, there's people from CERN that are working heavily on that, and we're going to track this. We also saw that there's now Glance tasks available. So we think we can do a lot of the things that we've done with Glint using um, Glance tasks. But our ultimate goal is to have this functionality um, integrated either within Keystone or Glance in some way that's suitable to the, the OpenStack developer community. And this is something that we've learned a lot about this week, and we're going to continue to uh, work on. All the code for this is available. It's in PyPy. It's on Launchpad. You can get it from, um, you can get it from GitHub as well. So now I want to talk about um, the virtual machine image we use. We use an appliance that's a RHEL-compatible appliance that's made by CERN. Um, it's a tiny image. It's a 20 megabyte image when you download it. It's similar. To, you can think about it a bit like CoreOS. Um, however, it uses this uh, thing called CVMFS, the CERN VM file system. And it's a, a file system designed around uh, millions of small files that's really all about heavily caching and multiple levels of caching. And in fact, when you start using this file system, um, you get a CDN that was built by CERN across research institutions and is resources provided by other research institutions for distributing the files that are in that file system. And it works extremely well for large software stacks like we have in high energy physics. I mean, to give you an example, one, one binary, one release of the Atlas experiment is a seven gigabytes worth of software. And you have many different users requiring many different versions. And using CVMFS, you can basically push out this nightly to all these VMs without releasing new versions of this um, virtual machine. Um, I would guess that there's many different industrial applications in particular for this um, file system. And you can get all sorts of information about it at this, at this URL here. So once you're using this file system, one of the things you require if you're going to boot large numbers of these virtual machines is a very fast HTTP cache, because this is an HTTP, HTTP um, caching file system. So what we use is the squid cache. Um, so what we want to be able to have is um, a virtual, uh, uh, a VM, or an, we want to be able to f locate the nearest, um, the nearest squid cache to our running virtual machines. 
so what will happen now and what does happen, or what did happen, I should say, is that we'd boot up a virtual machine that had some baked-in configuration, and that configuration was to use an HTTP cache on the other side of the world, which is you know, totally not workable. So we developed a quite simple um, discovery s service that uses AMQP and some very, very simple agents on the squid caches. Squid is an HTTP cache, and the reason this thing is called shoal is because shoal is the collective noun for a group of squids. That's where this name uh, shoal comes from. So we have agents that run on the squid caches. The, the agent is 170 lines, right, of, of Python, and it sends AMQP messages to the shoal server, heartbeat messages effectively, with some load information, and then we use a GeoIP library within the Shoal server, um, such that when a VM that's booted up on one of these arbitrary um, clouds contacts a REST interface, they end up with the closest VM. And so we can have these web caches disappearing and coming alive regularly. They advertise every 30 seconds. Um, we really depend on the scalability of AMQP to do this. Uh, we didn't, we didn't want to write a lot of code. There's probably other services that exist out there or that are coming online that may do the same thing. Um, this one was really focused on simplicity. So now I want to show you some evidence um, that this is all, all working smoothly. So here's a snapshot of activity from just the CERN instance of uh, Condor and Cloud Scheduler. The vertical axis here is number of VMs. These are eight core VMs. You can see the number of VMs booted changing. This is happening basically based on load at the time for the Atlas experiment. Um, the, the bottom axis here is days of the month ending on the 17th of May, which was the Sunday before I flew here. So the UVIC instance, this is showing a little bit more interesting activity. Here we had uh, another group request a bunch of resources. So we had to, um, this is just this operational task like I was talking about earlier, where we needed to give back a whole bunch of these resources for other users at the time. So we moved this large blue allocation from a particular cloud down and to give that allocation to other users. That usage isn't plotted here because we're plotting our own um, usage, but you see that the system is flexible and then you can see more jobs coming in the queue and the system ramping up. Here's a similar plot for the Bell 2 experiment. That was that second detector that I showed you. Um, so what you can see is that the, the system is portable between different types of experiments. Really the key thing is that it has to be, that your problem has to be formatted as a batch job. Um, and you need to, you know, so if you're using a cloud and you have a problem that's formulated in terms of an embarrassingly parallel batch job, the system will, will work for you, usually you know, depending on, on what, the, um, what the experiment is. But it will, you know, it'll work for any, basically any generalizable batch load. So, Here's, a, here's the cumulative, cumulative work um, on the Atlas experiment for this system. This is starting in January 1, um, 2014. In fact, the history goes back uh, quite a bit further. So the, the vertical axis here is uh, 3 million jobs. So the system has executed 3 million jobs um, since January of last year. So it's working pretty well. Um, this is chunked out into different instances that are roughly continental based, where we have queues on different continents um, with different groupings of clouds within them. This is you know, the list of the, well, if I go back here. This is, on, on the bottom, I neglected to point out that this is the, the list, of, uh, list of clouds on the bottom. So now this, is the cumulative load for the Bell 2 experiment. This is a much newer experiment, um, so the computing isn't quite as established and it's looking at new technologies uh, faster. So this, this is uh, from week of 11. So this is in the last little while. Um, you can see that cloud is making up 
uh, the second biggest fraction of the total contribution to the computing to this experiment right now. These are all the institutions around the world that are, that are doing computing for the Bell 2 experiment. This is the number of jobs. So you can see we've got around 500,000 jobs that are executed on this cloud system. The, the very big guy here is um, a big cluster in Germany, and in fact, the institutional labs cluster where the um, detector is actually located is this slice right here. So you can see that on, on, on uh, newer experiments, we're making a larger impact. So in, in summary, this combination of cloud scheduler and HD Condor is quite a flexible way to do batch computing on, um, on clouds. And there's a, some key enabling technologies. There's the CERN VM plus C CVM FS for us. There's the Squid Cache Discovery and this Glint system, which I think will be of the most uh, interest to the OpenStack community. And we're going to try and put as much of that back in as possible. Um, the current users of this system are Atlas, uh, Bell 2, CANFAR, which is an observational astronomy project. They, in fact, have completed 4 million jobs. I didn't show you the plots in the, re in the results here, but they're also a big user. And also um, a large uh, computing consortium called Compute Canada, which has uh, sites across the country in Canada. So I think that's it. We've got a few minutes for questions. I've been asked to direct people to the microphone for questions. And I also wanted, while well, people are lining up there, I also wanted to make sure that I acknowledge the many different groups that were participating in this. Um, without, their, without their contribution, none of this is possible because we're taking great advantage of the support and help of all these different organizations. If you would have had <coughs> admin on all the other clouds, if you would have owned the other clouds, have you thought about what you might have done differently? Well, in fact, we would have done virtually the same thing. Um, there wouldn't be much difference if we had admin on the, on the other clouds. In fact, it probably would have created a worse operational system for us because we'd have more clouds to support. Now we put in tickets to other people's malfunctioning clouds. So I'm, I'm, not, sure. <laughs> I'm not sure if it would have helped us to actually have admin access on these. Um, we, while you're scheduling uh, jobs uh, on different clouds, you also have to, to get the data, the generated data back from this cloud to you, the place you launch the job. And how do you achieve that? So one of, the, one of the advantages we have with these OpenStack clouds that are located within uh, research institutions is they're connected usually by very high-speed networks. So for example, at UVic, we have a 100 gig connection. Uh, and in fact, we have 100 gig all the way over the Atlantic to Geneva that is used mostly for research and education. So many of these institutes have quite high speed networks. So what we do is as the job finishes, we stage out the data. However, I want to mention that most of the jobs that you saw running there are these Monte Carlo simulation jobs. So the amount of output is much smaller than you would get from an, an analysis job. So this is one advantage we get with OpenStack running on research institutions is we can leverage that network um, to push the data back. A um, couple of questions. Um, I think one answer a little bit. So on the networking side, because you are running VMs in different locations, have you done any optimization to access the data remotely, caching? So what were, one of the, one of the reasons we have this segmented in, into continental bases is, is we don't want to push our data back across continents in general. So we, there is a lot of work left to be done on optimizing the data uh, placement, and this is one of the big um, challenges that's coming up. Um, the term that gets used a lot for this in physics is uh, data federations. So we need to, a lot of this in the past has been statically configured because we know where the sites are and where the data should go. And now that we're more dynamic, there's a lot of work left to be done there to make sure that the data hits the optimal cloud. Mostly it's far from optimal at the moment. Okay. The second question, um, uh, have you looked at or uh, there's a need to move the workloads um, in between uh, in that area? Um, so we have, we don't move the, I mean, one of the nice things that we, that you get from Condor is if a job dies or it's killed, it will get rescheduled somewhere else. So if we have, if we have some kind of catas um, catastrophe on a cloud and all the jobs die and all the VMs die, which, which happens, 
um, then Condor will reschedule them somewhere else. But we haven't done any migration of jobs. Um, one of the difficulties we have is there's no way to suspend a high energy physics job. They're making connections to databases all over the place and they might be in the middle of doing something and there's it's different from a normal high performance computing job that you could snapshot and take the state of but you know, nobody knows how to do that at the moment. What, what tools do you use to, for, to manage your hybrid cloud um, and are you equally happy with AWS and GCE for your uh, high throughput and um, is it just the cloud scheduler or do you have other decision points? Um, it's this, I'm sorry that it's called Cloud Scheduler, by the way. <laughs> we named it before everything was called Cloud Something. But um, yeah, this is the main thing that's making the decision about where to run uh, the VMs. And in terms of experiences on Amazon and GCE, in general, we've had very good experiences. Where we run into mixed issues is getting the data back out of Amazon. Depending on where you are sitting in the world, you can get very high speed peering out of Amazon back to your data center. Um, so we've had, we've had sort of mixed results with that. Um, Energy Sciences Network in the US now has a direct 100 gig peering with Amazon. So if you've got to stage your data back out of Amazon to, uh, to a site that is on the Energy Sciences Network, this is Department of Energy Labs. You could do that very quickly. So um, many of our challenges around that have been associated with data in and out. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with GCE, so I don't think I can uh, comment on that. It's other people in the group who have. Uh, a couple slides back, you had a uh, total number of jobs by, co by country with Canada, Canada and the UK on there. I was surprised not to see the US on that list. Yes, okay, so um, the reason we haven't done that, there's in fact cloud groups within the US that are um, running the Atlas jobs on clouds in the US. We didn't show them here because they're using systems that are not cloud scheduler. If okay. I was giving this as a collaboration talk to my, with US collaborators, I would also show all their work, which is extensive. Okay, so they don't use Condor, they use some sort of different technology um, for they've, doing their jobs. There's, they've taken various different approaches. It usually involves Condor in some fashion, but it can also involve uh, bringing up, rather than trying to dynamically bring up uh, VMs uh, as jobs come in, you can also bring up a whole cluster, have it join at the same time. So yeah, there's different, different approaches being taken at different, uh, within different countries. Okay, thanks. Okay, I think we're almost exactly 40 minutes here, so I'm pretty happy about that. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>